So I have uh, recently written a book uh, called The Speed of Time, which is not on security, but part of that is uh, on security and uh, how we might strike disaster in terms of uh, some of the uh, new areas coming in from uh, the pure science. What I'm trying to uh, do here is to basically start off saying that uh, for the past 2,000 years, there has been a war between the code makers and code breakers. And sometimes the code makers are winning, sometimes the code breakers are winning, and you know, it's been uh, even uh, you know, uh, uh, a game so far. But uh, if you look at the World War I, the war was basically fought uh, with the help of the chemists, right? They used, uh, you know, mustard and chlorine and so on. And the Second World War belonged to the physicists uh, because of the nuclear bomb that they discovered. And the Third uh, World War, if it happens, belongs to the mathematicians, all right? So the reason I'm saying that is that uh, if you look at the RSA code, you know, the public uh, cri uh, key uh, cryptography, it's all based on the maths, which is primarily uh, using the, uh, you know, prime numbers, multiplying those two prime numbers and coming up with a composite number and giving you the composite number as a public key and expecting uh, uh, you to keep those two prime numbers secret with you, right? So what is happening today is that RSA algorithm is completely based on the assumption that nobody can factorize a given uh, composite number. And uh, obviously the, uh, the algorithm itself uses a very, very high, you know, large size prime numbers, sometimes to the, you know, 10 days to, you know, one, uh, to the power of 150 or so. so. Given that kind of a large number, it's almost impossible. In fact, RSA uh, pay, white paper pretty, pretty much clearly states that it's not possible for anyone to break this code at all. Even if you combine all the computers, pieces together that exist today, it takes at least 100 million times the age of the universe to break that code. So if that is the case, then we all should be pretty safe with the existing encryption uh, methods. But there is a kind of a possibility that uh, this is based again on the history, right? Every time a new uh, encryption code came, that was broken. This is the only one that has been, you know, uh, there for the uh, for more than two decades now, unbroken. And when you deal with the prime numbers, that basically is used by these encryption uh, algorithms. Uh, they use a pretty large ones, and the latest prime number itself is 17 million digits long. All right. This is the largest prime number, but they won't be using this much large number, but there's no uh, stopping that this particular algorithm can use any uh, size uh, you know, prime number. E-commerce depends on it, all your bank transactions depend on it, uh, your credit card uh, you know, credentials, everything depends on that. So how do we ensure that uh, this continues to remain safe and there's no guarantee, all right? Although you know, we know that nothing has happened for this kind of a you know RSA uh, encryption met method for the past three decades, so possibly it will not happen at all. Let's hope for the best. Now, if you move back to 150 years, uh, Bernard Riemann has uh, come up with the uh, Riemann uh, Riemann hypothesis, which is basically the a mathematical conjecture. What that conjecture tells is primarily. Uh, how one can count the number of prime numbers below a given large number, all right? So if I say one million and pass it on to a function called zeta function, which is Riemann's zeta function, it will tell you exactly how many prime numbers are there, not exactly, sorry, how many prime numbers are there below that particular large number that you mentioned in this function. This is an unproven conjecture. It carries a price of $1 million. This is one of the six or seven mathematical problems, uh, open problems today. And uh, anyone who solves this particular uh, hypothesis or says it is, it's, it's false or true will uh, win uh, $1 million from the Clay Mathematical uh, Institution. 
now the question is uh, this has been actually uh, tested for more than 1 trillion numbers so far for 1 trillion values riemann hypothesis seems to work if you now try to now say that because it is working for 1 trillion numbers it must be working for ever all, all the numbers right so that's not true because there were other similar hypotheses which worked for values up to 1 trillion and then they started failing after that. So it's that what we need is a very massive computing power to really go to any extent to test this particular hypothesis. And the only way to do that is to jump into another domain of computing that's called quantum computing. And uh, that's what I'll just quickly touch upon. So as I said, the problem is uh, essentially that uh, if uh, Riemann hypothesis is found to be true, it might lead to a method of factorization of composite number. And if that happens, that is the end of the RSA algorithm. That's the end of the encryption that we're using today. So this, there is a disaster uh, you know, uh, in the corner. We might uh, not face it at all, but we might possibly face it because of certain development that's happening in the quantum computing world. Quantum computing is all based on the quantum physics. All right? So quantum physics basically states that there are two properties, extremely bizarre, weird properties. One property is called superposition. What superposition is, is saying is that uh, at the subatomic level, the photons or the electrons exist at two places simultaneously. So as just a small hypothetical case, electron exists on my left side as well as it exists on my right side at the same time, all right? Each one of these subatomic particles also have what is called a spin, a property called spin. They spin clockwise or anti-clockwise. The property that makes the atoms or electrons or photons spin in both the directions, same time, has been tested. The moment you try to see which side it's uh, turning or you know spinning, it stops spinning in both the directions and starts spinning only in one direction. That's a kind of an enigma. That's a kind of a mystery that underlies the quantum mechanics. This is one mystery. The other mystery is what is called a quantum entanglement. What quantum entanglement states is that if you somehow pick up two electrons from an atom and take them far away from each other, one you keep here and the other one to the end of the universe. If you make some measurement on this particular uh, particle, there is an instant communication that happens to the other particle and that uh, is as good as being measured. Now, this defies Einstein's theory of relativity, which is basically there's a limit on the speed at which the light travels, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. So if given that, given that kind of a, you know, a mystery, uh, how, is that, how is it that you know, quantum mechanics can be tested? Quantum mechanics, by the way, has been tested thoroughly. It works perfectly all right. That means that there is no denying the fact that if, if a quantum computer is built using these two properties, the computing power that we can derive out of this is infinite. If, for example, in the classical computing system, if you use bit system, in quantum computing, you use qubits. 2 raised to 8, or 2 raised to 7, uh, 8, for example, is 256 number of states that you can end up with in classical computers. But in case of qubit, you still end up with the same number of states, but those number of states, 250 states, are simultaneous states. All right? And if you now raise it to 2 raised to 50 or 2 raised to 100, you can imagine the amount of states that are available. In fact, as I just came to this lecture today, there was a breaking news in the, in the, in the, in the science domain that in Oxford University, in the quantum lab, they were able to testify, uh, sorry, test the existence of the quantum entanglement, and they were able to test it out for 39 minutes, holding a state, quantum state, for more than one second, itself was a big deal about three years ago. Today, they are able to maintain that particular state. Why should one maintain this particular state? Because if somebody makes an observation 
That means if somebody is eavesdropping on what's happening within the com uh, computing environment, the entire uh, you know, uh, entanglement or the support position collapses. That means that the entire system breaks down. That means that somebody can come to know that somebody is eavesdropping on the messages. This is the Sch Schrodinger cat, which is existing as well as dying at the same time. It is dead as well as alive, all right? It's dead in this universe, alive in the next universe. This has been tested practically, which is exactly the same as what I mentioned, that an electron exists in this universe, but it may not be existing in some other universe. It's there is a quantum entanglement, which is uh, basically Alice trying to send the message to uh, you know Bob, and Eve is eavesdropping. Uh, they are using the photons to basically polarize a photon and create the codes. Uh, Alice's bit should match with the Bob's bit, which is not happening here. Only part of the message is mapping, but that's good enough. But if Eve tries to drop uh, eavesdrop on that particular message, then the entire pattern collapses. That means somebody is, you know, uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, steal away your message. That's the kind of information we have. Uh, so the quantum key distribution, uh, sorry, quantum key distribution, which is basically the new way of creating the public keys, is now getting evolved. And I won't be surprised in the next five to 10 years, quantum computers will completely change the way we uh, develop our security systems. Thank you.